You're listening to a Rock Candy podcast. Hi, I'm Peter Santoscano, and this is Bubble and Squeak, a podcast with uncanny sounds, funny interludes, and stories. Most weird, many true. Okay, here's episode six. Our show today comes in three parts. Part one, a true story entitled, What is this? Part two, a television transmission from the future. And part three, a sound slice created for us by Taylor Lightman. What is this? A true story. In the late 1980s in New York City, I worked as a waiter. Now, this was not a standard restaurant. I served in the private executive dining rooms on the 50th floor of the American Express Tower. It stood in the shadow of the World Trade Towers. Each morning, I arrived very early and served breakfast to the president of American Express or the chairman of the board, sometimes both of them together. Now, although I grew up working in a restaurant, Pete's Pub, my parents' Italian-American restaurant in the Catskills, I was not prepared for the high-end demands of this fancy dining room. I wore a white tuxedo, there was Baccarat crystal, and I needed to do silver service. During the initial interview, Teak, the head waiter, wasn't concerned about my lack of experience. Teak was gay about, well, in his early 40s, stout, short, gay man. He spoke with just a shadow of a southern accent that became stronger whenever he was stressed, and he was often stressed. He reassured me, I can teach anyone to serve silver service. He then waved his hand towards the wait staff folding napkins in the other end of the dining hall out of earshot. Half were middle-aged straight women, about a third were black and Latino men and women, the rest were young, white, handsome gay men. He said, If I had my way, I would only hire waiters like you. Two times a year, the board of directors gathered on site and then had a formal lunch in our dining halls. Teak pulled me aside. I want you to work the head table. This was where the chairman of the board sat with high-powered board members, including former U.S. President Gerald Ford and former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Now, you may not remember how Ford became president. He started out as a congressman. He was never elected to the presidency, but he became Speaker of the House. But then Richard Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigned amidst allegations of tax evasion and money laundering. So Ford became vice president. But then Nixon resigned from the presidency in order to avoid impeachment. Ford then became the U.S. president. An hour before lunch, Secret Service agents clogged the hallways with their earpieces and speaking into their wrist. Everyone was on edge, especially Brigitte. Brigitte oversaw all of the operations of the dining room and the kitchen. I believe she was originally from Belgium and had that high energy of an angry terrier. (laughs) She was in her, I guess her late 60s and spoke with this weird hybrid accent. When she was relaxed, which was rare, she sounded French. But stressed and annoyed, her accent became more and more German. Some of us joked that she was really Eva Braun, Hitler's lover who had escaped the war and now lived disguised as Brigitte. The first course of the lunch was shrimp cocktail. I floated out into the dining room. It was filled with giant floral arrangements that were imported every week from Paris. I served each guest a crystal goblet overflowing with large, plump, perfectly steamed shrimp, and there was a dollop of some sauce in the middle. I reached Henry Kissinger last. He looked at the shrimp, then up at me. What is this? he asked. It's shrimp cocktail, sir. I don't want this. Take it away. I walked back to the kitchen with this single shrimp cocktail on my tray. Brigitte, looking through the porthole-like window, scowled. What is it? Um, Henry Kissinger doesn't want shrimp? And this cry (laughs) went up and was echoed around the kitchen. Henry Kissinger doesn't want shrimp! Henry Kissinger doesn't want shrimp! Henry Kissinger doesn't want shrimp! A chef suddenly produced 
A canary melon expertly sliced it and garnished it with strawberries cut to look like tiny fans. He dropped it on my tray, spun me around, and pushed me back out into the dining room to Henry Kissinger. Brigitte watched from the window. I placed the melon in front of Kissinger. He looked at it, then at me. What is this? I suddenly thought of my mom, Anita Toscano, who was never impressed or intimidated when celebrities came to her restaurant. One busy Saturday night at Pete's Pub, a waitress gingerly approached my mom in the kitchen. Deborah Winger and her party were fussing about how long the food was taking. My mom grabbed a basket, stuffed some hot Italian bread in it, stormed out into the dining room. She slammed the basket in front of Deborah Winger and said, I got a lot of hungry people ahead of you, so relax, eat your bread, or get the hell out. I thought of lots I could say to Henry Kissinger at that moment. Like, weren't you Secretary of State? Didn't you travel the world, whining and dining with the elites? Weren't you involved in politics, meddling in Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East? In all that time, did you ever once encounter a melon? Because this, sir, is a fucking melon. I thought of all that in a flash and stuffed it down. Because... I wasn't my mom. I wasn't Anita Toscano. See, I wanted to please everyone. I wanted to please the president of American Express when I served him his morning grapefruit. I wanted to please Teak, who fawned over me every day to make sure my collar was straight. I wanted to please my pastor and God as I daily repented for being gay and submitted to ridiculous and dangerous treatments that constantly failed to cure me and only made my life worse. So I smiled. It's a melon, sir. I don't want it. Take it away. I returned to the kitchen. Brigitte's wrath was oozing out of her eyes. What is it? Um, Henry Kissinger doesn't want melon. A chorus shot around the kitchen. Henry Kissinger doesn't want melon. Henry Kissinger doesn't want melon. Henry Kissinger doesn't want melon. The chef dashed into the walk-in cooler for something. Another chef snatched the melon from my tray and tossed it into the garbage. Brigitte barked, Ach, the hell mit Henry Kissinger. Go to the next course. The next course. I'm holding on to this life. Just by the skin of my teeth. You think that I'm just a relic. You say You're watching Turner Classic Movies. Launched in 1994, we've brought you classic films for over 175 years. I'm Bernard Torres, and you're watching Masturbate Theatre. All this month, we're screening gay pornography films from the 80s, 90s, and noughties. It's been nearly 200 years since these films were first released and shown in adult movie theaters and private screening rooms. They stood the test of time. Newly remastered and rendered in 3D, we believe you will thoroughly enjoy today's films. At 3 o'clock, we have Matt Sterling's 1984 masterpiece, The Bigger the Better, starring Rick Donovan as Rick. Peter North as Rick's teacher, Matt Ramsey, and Mark Ramsey as Mike. Beautifully shot in colour, Sterling packs a lot of action in his one hour and eight minute film. In addition to the smashing hot sex scenes, the bigger the better also includes some of the best dialogue in his genre. Take this scene, for instance. Why should I have a seat? Why should you sit on my dick? On that? Yeah. Come on. At 4.10, we feature William Higgins' 1987 award-winning film, Big Guns. It's one of the most celebrated films to come out of the famed Laguna Pacific Studios. Based on Top Gun, a major mainstream motion picture of the time, Big Guns earned the coveted Best Film category at the X-Rated Critics Award. 
After being released on digital versatile disc, Big Guns received the Best Classic Award at the 2002 Grabby Ceremonies. One reviewer stated William Higgins' all-time top-selling feature is still incredibly influential and incredibly hot, filled with steamy pre-condom era mouth and asshole pluggings. But first, we show you Max Soul's 2004 classic film Dawson's 20 Load Weekend. It stars the award-winning actor Dawson. The film went on to win six Bareback Video Sponge Awards, including Video of the Year. Dawson received multiple awards, including Best Newcomer and Hottest Bottom. Four years later, Dawson went on to win a Golden Dicky Award as Best Amateur Bottom. And here's a little trivia about the film. Uh, at the time it was released, it created a huge controversy. Nearly two and a half hours long, Dawson's 20-load weekend is mainly composed of bareback sex. This was, of course, before the complete eradication of sexually transmitted diseases like HIV-AIDS. Today on Turner Classic Movies, we show you the director's cut in its entirety, fully remastered and rendered in 3D. If you've ever dreamed of spending an entire weekend taking load after load up your wide-open cum-craving hole, or if you've ever longed to breathe the sticky slick hole of a hot, masculine young man, you'll love Dawson's 20-load weekend. Sit back, unzip, and enjoy Master Bay Theatre's screening of the 2004 classic film Dawson's 20 Load Weekend. My lips like books are burning, yes, now I can't unlearn it. This travel fire like an empire of tables turning. I'm reading in my question, exhaling my direction. You see, you like my discretion, but you love the little cracks in my display. Let me set the scene for you. It was a small-town summer in the Alps. Sage incense, green tea, frosty air, lightning in the distance, mountain goats, saunas, horseradish and honey relish on freshly baked bread. In the mountains, everything is strong and meaningful. On one hike, my brother and I happened upon a herd of cows. Each cow had a copper cowbell coupled to its neck with a thick leather strap. The way the cows moved their bodies rang that bell the way it was meant to be rung, each ring impregnated with expression, floating a mile, an offering to the mountain goddesses. Re-enchant yourself with the world. Offer what only you can offer. Ring your bell and show me meaning. Bubblin's Week is written and produced by me, Peter Santoscano. I mostly make this show for me and for my friend Daniel, who has beautifully modeled what overcoming conversion therapy looks like. Many thanks to Taylor Lightman for providing the sound slice on today's show. Follow Taylor on Twitter at Taylor Lightman or on Instagram at The Real Taylor Lightman. Our theme song is Worthless by the Jelly Rocks from the Bang and Whimper album. You also heard Kick the Habit by Eleven E Seven from their Rad Science album and Dangerous by The Fast Feeling, which appears on their Pulses album. You can find these songs on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to music. If you want to get in touch with me, feel free to tweet at me at p 2 Sun. the letter P, the number 2, S-O-N. And thanks for listening.
For more shows like this one, visit rockcandyrecordings.com.